Governor. I, uh, I'm Bill Hoagland, uh, Senior Vice President here, and I have the pleasure of working with our health care team as we seek, as you can believe it, to try to find some bipartisan consensus on policies impacting our uh, health care system. Along with uh, BPC's Chief Medical Advisor, Anand Parak, Anand and I were privileged to have uh, provided input into the Public Health Leadership Forum at Resolve this last year as they worked to develop some form of a national plan on investment in our public health infrastructure system. Anand um, will shortly moderate a discussion uh, with uh, this issue with our two distinguished uh, bipartisan guests, the Honorable Governor Jim Douglas and the Honorable Martin O'Malley. But first, um, I want to highlight a, a recent national survey uh, that was commissioned by the DeMont, uh, Belmont uh, Foundation. And they found that a rare consensus across uh, uh, political affiliation, geography, race, income, education, on the critical importance that public health departments play in the health of their communities. It's found that 89 percent, hard to believe, 89 percent of Americans overwhelmingly agreed that such entities were essential in providing basic health care services and protection. But unfortunately, as you will hear this afternoon, only about 50 percent of our um, population is served by a comprehensive health plan, uh, public health system. How to address that shortfall, what it would cost, how would it be paid for, uh, is the purpose of this discussion uh, this afternoon. Before we begin as an old budgeteer, some of you might know, I can't resist uh, a couple of numbers to maybe level set the discussion this afternoon. Uh, just last week, the CMS uh, Office of Actuaries reported that our national expenditures total, state, federal, local, in 2017, our national health expenditures were $3.7 trillion. And researchers who have uh, parse these numbers, estimate that less than 3 percent of this 3.7 trillion is targeted on public health programs, or maybe a hundred billion dollars. But critically, 80 to 90 percent of that hundred billion is largely paid for by state and local expenditures and resources. So roughly, um, back of the envelope, 10 to 20 billion dollars of public health system that we have in this country is supported by federal resources. For comparison purposes, the federal government expends uh, annually nearly $65 billion to support state and localities transportation and water infrastructure. There is a rumor about, even despite the meeting that just occurred at the White House, that, uh, that, that between the President and the new speaker likely to be, that a divided 116th Congress will want to show movement on some legislative fronts next year. And one of those areas might be infrastructure investment. So one message maybe to the new Congress then emanating from this report from the Public Health Leadership Forum today might be that our public health infrastructure is equally as important to America's future as is its transportation, water, sewer infrastructure, both physically and fiscally. So to kick off this discussion, two friends of BPC and the primary authors of this study uh, will provide an overview of the issue. Karen DeSalvo, MD, Dr. DeSalvo, currently professor of medicine, Dell Medical School, University of Texas, Austin, and formerly Assistant Secretary of Health and Jeffrey Levy, professor of health policy and management, George Washington University, and formerly executive director, Trust for American Health. So, Karen. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Bill, thank you so much for the introduction and for the opportunity to be here. Um, more importantly, Bill, thank you for your insights uh, and, and your encouragement as we were thinking about um, how to, to provide public health protection for all Americans. The timing of this work uh, is more important now than ever. Public health has long had the responsibility of protecting the public's health and is widely credited with a, a successful track record of, of doing so. We know that investing in public health saves lives, that it saves money 
money and it has extended life expectancy in the U.S. by 25 years in the 20th century through a variety of efforts ranging from vaccines to uh, efforts around cardiovascular disease to efforts around motor vehicle safety and smoking cessation programs. But for the first time in generations, life expectancy in the U.S. is on the decline now for three years uh, in a row. It's not linked to a specific disease, this decline, but rather to a set of complex public health issues with roots and challenges like loneliness uh, and other social factors that are impacting people's health. And it manifests as unacceptably high rates of maternal and infant mortality in the opioid epidemic, in rising suicide rates. And it, it is aggravated by emerging threats from disasters like wildfires, hurricanes, uh, and a bad potential flu season. That is layered on top of our nation's chronic uh, public health challenges like cardiovascular disease, mental health, cancer, childhood obesity, HIV, AIDS. And all these threats are taking a toll on not only the length but also the quality of life for people. It's impacting the health and vitality of our communities. Uh, and it's also having an impact on our state and our federal budgets. So to address these talent challenges, we often turn to public health uh, to to heed the call to action to improve the public's health. And public health, as you will hear a little bit later today in our panel from people on the front lines or who have been on the front lines, is stepping up to heed this challenge to improve the public's health. Uh, it is uh, a, new, a new era called Public Health 3.0, one in which public health departments are stepping outside of traditional boundaries and programs and working more strategically with the private sector, thinking about how to leverage modern tools like big data to really have a 21st century model of how we can address these 21st century complex public health threats. I know from my own experience doing this work in New Orleans and from what I have seen in communities in every time zone and temperate zone across this country that this kind of modern public health, as exciting as it is, also requires a strong foundation. It requires that foundation that is uh, part of the day-to-day -day work as well as the opportunity to be resilient in disaster. Health, pu public health professionals call these this foundation the foundational capabilities, a very original name, um, which are cross-cutting skills and capabilities key to protecting our community's health and achieving equitable outcomes across the board. It means that if every health department had these kinds of foundational capabilities, that no matter your zip code, you would be you would have public health protection that we would all want for our families and communities. There are seven key areas. I'm going to run through them just because it's going to come up later in our conversation. But the seven core areas that we're talking about today in terms of necessity and financing are assessment, uh, using surveillance and data to understand not only the current but emerging threats to the community's health. The second is all hazards preparedness, yes, for the disasters that hit the headlines like hurricanes, but also for those small disasters that public health is dealing with every day like boil water advisories. Policy development, taking science and applying it to things like tobacco policy to prevent kids from starting smoking. Communications about impending challenges like a freeze warning for a community or uh, information that they need to know about uh, a foodborne illness. The fifth is community partnership and development, really harnessing uh, community resources and working with the private sector to leverage the best for everyone in a community. The sixth is about organizational competencies that allow for a strategic approach in partnership uh, with other parts of government and with the private sector to really um, focus on multi-sectoral, broad public health issues like the social determinants of health. And the seventh is about accountability and performance. This is the basic business functionality of departments where they're working to really step up their accountability, their inherent structure to have the kind of uh, business efficiencies that we would all expect uh, from any part of government, especially public health. You know, our nation really depends upon public health having these minimum requirements to meet the foundational capabilities and be able to address the public's health across the board to see that no matter where you live, your geographic boundary doesn't define whether you'll be protected from a threat, whether that's a biohazard or a, a natural disaster or some emerging infection. It's how we will assure that Americans have an opportunity at a healthier life uh, and more vitality. But the disturbing truth, as you'll hear more about in a moment, is that 
public health across the country is really struggling to not only step up to meet the 21st century challenges and be a 21st century infrastructure, because it's struggling by being chronically underfunded like very much of the country's other infrastructure. And addressing this shortfall is the responsibility of civil society, but also of government at all levels to see that we can protect and promote the public's health. And that's why we've been working with colleagues to develop a framework that would have a rational approach to understanding not only the needs and also the gap and an approach to ad addressing uh, not only the financing shortfall, but allow public health to do the work that it must do to address our disturbing uh, threats to life expectancy and other health challenges. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jeff Levy, who's going to tell us more about that framework. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Karen. Um, and thanks to the Bipartisan Policy Center for having us here today. I can't underestimate um, or understate uh, the degree, or can't overestimate and can't understate uh, the degree to which the Public Health 3.0 concept or vision um, has really been embraced by the public health community and is seen by policymakers as an appropriate way of thinking about what public health does for our country and for Americans. And this notion that where you live shouldn't determine the level of protection and that you get is also something that resonates deeply with a lot of people. So our task um, in this project was really to translate this vision and concept into reality by finding, identifying what new resources are needed to assure that every community is served by government, a governmental public health system that is able to deliver on these foundational public health capabilities. So the Public Health Leadership Forum convened experts to advise po policymakers and the public health community about how to finance this transformation. The Public Health Leadership Forum is an ongoing platform to engage public health leaders, practitioners, policymakers, and other stakeholders in problem-solving dialogue to address issues regarding the transforming health system. It's managed by Resolve, and you'll hear from Abby Dilley from Resolve later, which Resolve is an organization that uses consensus building to design innovative solutions to very difficult problems. This project of the Leadership Forum was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and you can see from the list of experts who participated in this process, it's in the full report that you received, that we really touched a broad range of constituencies, stakeholders, and experts in developing this proposal. So as we undertook this work, what did we find? First and most compelling is the evidence, as Bill mentioned, that according to an ongoing national survey, only 51% of the population is served by a comprehensive public health system. We just can't do the basic things we need to do unless we are all served by a comprehensive public health system. Some states are already embracing this concept of foundational capabilities in Washington and Oregon and Ohio, to name three. Considerable effort is going into estimating what it would take to, develop, to provide these foundational capabilities and develop a trajectory and a plan for getting there. Um, but they are limited by the fact that they are depending on their own resources without additional federal help to make this happen. Um, so in fact, any state that wants to build these foundational capabilities faces a very daunting task. Uh, according to one national study validated by some state level analysis, an annual outlay of $32 per person is required to put in place the full range of foundational capabilities. Yet current spending is only about $19 per person. That's a $13 per person gap. In short, when you do the arithmetic, we need about $4.5 billion in new funding to assure that all Americans have the level of protection they rightly expect from public health. So to begin our work, with the help of our experts, we developed a set of principles to guide the financing solution. These included that public health is a shared responsibility between the federal government and its state, local, territorial, and tribal partners. And thus, the federal government should not tell jurisdictions how to organize their public health system, but just set the expectation that with additional resources, progress needs to be made to assure that all residents are protected by foundational public health capabilities. Consistent with the notion that public health is a shared responsibility, we also said, concluded that financing should also be a shared responsibility. And thus, states would need to contribute to the financing of foundational public health capabilities. In addition, there also needs to be accountability. If we're going to put new money out there, 
Policymakers and the public expects a level of accountability, and so we need to set national standards to define with specificity what it means to provide quality provision of foundational capabilities. So what does that mean in terms of this public health infrastructure fund that we have proposed? The fund would be a new mandatory funding stream that would be in addition to current appropriations. Most of the appropriations say go to programs. We need to start investing in those foundational capabilities. It would total $4.5 billion and include a state match of 10 percent, and so the federal share would be about $4 billion. It would build over time. We know that this amount of money couldn't be absorbed overnight, but starting with initial grants to do planning and to really develop a pathway toward achieving these foundational capabilities and a pathway developed in close cooperation between state government and local health departments. Funds would be distributed on a per capita basis with the Secretary of Health and Human Services being able to develop a risk adjustment formula to, to, to account for differing levels of investment, differing tax bases, and the like. Funds would be used to help state, local, territorial, and tribal health departments achieve accreditation. As foundational public health capabilities become part of the accreditation process, that's our accountability mechanism. And after three years, all health departments would have to be accredited in order to continue receiving this new money. So how do we get from this proposal to adoption? Well, that's what today is about, in part, to start the dialogue among a broad spectrum of actors and experts. We anticipate many opportunities for Congress and the administration. Bill highlighted the infrastructure possibility. There are many opportunities in the course of budgeting and, and authorizing and creating new programs and addressing health reform issues uh, that may arise in the coming year. This is a big amount for public health. But as Bill mentioned, compared to the $3.7 trillion being spent on our health system writ large, it is very, very small. The recent national health expenditure estimates remind us how much work remains to be done regarding containing health care costs and improving health outcomes. But there is a growing recognition that building, a healthy, building healthier communities requires collaboration between the health system and public health, and that public health can bring the community level perspective and can improve the overall health of a community that will ultimately drive down health costs and ultimately improve health outcomes. But that can only happen if we invest in public health and create the capacity for public health to be a true partner with a healthcare delivery system. So I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Anand Parekh, who is the Chief Medical Officer of the Bipartisan Policy, Policy Center and has been a really important partner in this project. Well, Jeff, th thank you so much for that introduction, and it's my honor uh, to introduce uh, to all of you, many of you already know our, our two governors, uh, former Vermont Governor uh, Jim Douglas. Uh, governor Douglas served as the 80th governor of the state of Vermont from 2002 to 2010 and, and is also on BPC's Governor's Council. And Governor Martin O'Malley, who served as the 61st governor of the state of Maryland from 2007 to 2015 and previously served um, for eight years as mayor of the city of Baltimore. And uh, governors, welcome to, to BPC, and thank you for your commitment to, to both uh, innovation as well as, as results. Uh, this is a pretty important moment, I think, uh, in our nation's history when it comes to health. As Karen just mentioned, this is the first time in 100 years that this country is now experiencing three years consecutively of decreasing life expectancy. The last time this happened was World War I and, and the 1918 uh, great pandemic, influenza pandemic. And so, and, and there were a lot of factors contributing to all this, and Karen mentioned many of them, drug overdoses and suicides and the leveling off and declines from mortality from chronic diseases, influenza last year. But given this setting um, and this context, and based on your experiences in, in your respective states, can you share your thoughts about the value of having a strong public health infrastructure. And I'll also add, how do we get public health into infrastructure policy discussions and, and debate? Governor? Well, it's uh, essential uh, for the reasons you've outlined and uh, um, Karen and Jeff did. Um, um, Vermont is one of the oldest states in America. Um, we're the second oldest by median age. We're rapidly aging. 
our workforce is declining. Uh, we have fewer people uh, working in Vermont than we did a decade ago. Our overall population is down slightly. Um, so we've got a real demographic challenge. And I've said to Vermonters through the years that we have to um, build our economy uh, through uh, among other strategies, uh, a, a greater commitment to public health. We need people to work longer uh, as they get older. We need to reach out to disadvantaged segments of our population and engage them uh, in, the, uh, in the workforce. We need to uh, reach out to um, uh, the disabled community and get them involved so that we have more people working, uh, contributing to the public treasury and supporting uh, the state that we all love. Um, and that requires a strong public health commitment, and we've had it. Uh, you're going to uh, hear later from Dr. Paul Jarris, who is Commissioner of Health in Vermont, and taught me everything I knew and know. <laughs> I've forgotten a lot, I think, Paul. But, um, but, uh, but that was his focus and ours, because uh, we, need to, uh, uh, we need to make sure that, uh, that we have that in place. So we're working with the federal government, and we'll talk about that relationship, I'm sure, in a minute, uh, Anand. Uh, we uh, got a commitment to uh, deploy Medicaid dollars for preventive care. We focused on chronic disease management because with our older population, um, obviously, uh, we're likely to have a large segment with one or more chronic illnesses. Uh, we focused on uh, young people, on the elderly, on people where they work. Uh, and, uh, and we were successful, I might suggest, because uh, uh, the United Health rankings uh, listed Vermont as the healthiest state for a number of years running. So uh, we, we made that commitment, um, and uh, I think we uh, have to make sure that every state across America continues to, to make that a priority. Governor? Yeah, I, I enjoyed reading the, the, uh, the recommendations and the report. I think it's absolutely spot on, and it reminded me very much of the way in a much more deliberate and intentional way, mind you. It reminded me of the way we all scrambled around after the attacks of 9-11. Uh, there was an emergency. There, was block grant, there were block grants going to the states and to the cities. And at one of those hearings, I recall Senator Dornan from uh, North Dakota asking, well, suppose we actually had a kind of minimum level, maybe a better word is proficient, level of Homeland Security, what would it look like? What are the capacities and capabilities we should have that we don't have now that these grant dollars help you arrive at, at achieving? And in a way, that's what you've really done with this report, is to say that there are some, there are some building blocks, foundational capacities that every state should have, that every citizen should expect that their state, local, federal government should uh, be working to uh, uh, provide and maintain and, and uh, exercise, if you will, uh, around the ability to assess, to detect uh, uh, the, the syndromic monitors, the uh, biosurveillance capacities, the, uh, you know, the, the capacity for, for uh, acute care, a surge, uh, the ability to actually have benchmarks and performance measures that will tell us whether we're achieving these things. And I want to say hats off on the score of accreditation. I think it's really, really, really important that as citizens, uh, we know that our tax dollars are actually resulting in certain levels of proficiency and ability and capacity to protect us in the event of a big emergency. Now, the tougher part of your question is how to, how to make this part of the infrastructure discussion. But I, I do believe that expectations over the longer arc uh, become behavior. And I think that we should expect that as a nation, we achieve better health outcomes, less disparity, and, uh, and are, are better prepared for the sorts of emergencies uh, and uh, pandemics that are going to come. Now, it may well be that uh, this report gets much uh, more uh, uh, attention in the wake of uh, of an outbreak than it does at this very moment. But it's, it, it is the moments like these across partisan uh, divides that really set the framework that allow us to, uh, uh, to, uh, to capture that focus on when, when it does arrive. So hats off to you. It is, a, it is a, a great report, very solid recommendations. And let's be honest, I mean, it's a rounding error compared to what we already spend on health care and what we kind of flushed away in the last round of tax cuts 
uh, that everybody's forgotten about now a year later. Let me give a shout out to my Secretary of Health, who oh. taught me everything that I have forgotten <laughs> about health. Josh Sharfstein and also Maryland's own uh, Georges Benjamin, who uh, led uh, as Secretary of Health in, in the state of Maryland at one time as well. I, I want to say b before we, we got up here, I, uh, since the governors, both of their respective state health commissioners and yeah. secretaries are in the audience, so, so I promised them to ask them only the easy questions yeah, and right. to turf all the difficult questions into and the next battle. So. They are, they're the ones that are lip syncing in the front <laughs> <end> <laughs> as we answer each of these questions. Yeah. Well, you get very nervous. It yeah. is intimidating, isn't it? I, I do want to ask a follow-up. Um, Governor, you mentioned sort of post-9-11. Um, both of you, thinking back to your tenures, both of you experienced public health emergencies or crises or, very, or specific public health challenges. Both of you come from states with strong public health systems. But talk a little bit about maybe one example of a public health crisis or emergency or challenge where you really valued having a strong and vibrant public health agency with with uh, with uh, outstanding capabilities well we were lucky that uh, we didn't have a really big problem on my watch uh, a few months after i left i knew when to step down uh, <laughs> we had a disastrous flood uh, but i really believe that the infrastructure we put in place served us well uh, not only public health but emergency management uh, generally um, because we have what's called an all hazards management uh, uh, training uh, strategy in Vermont. Um, some of the responses are the same, whether it's a, uh, an anthrax outbreak or a, um, a nuclear plant meltdown or a, a, a terrorist attack or an ice storm. Um, we have to make sure that people have uh, the basic uh, necessities of life, shelter and food and, and uh, medicine and, uh, and, and safety. Um, so we get together um, not knowing exactly what the crisis might be, uh, but uh, folks from all the different agencies that might be affected uh, uh, came and uh, to our emergency operations center. We had drills. Um, we uh, uh, had one specific health one, I remember, uh, Paul, where um, uh, it was uh, uh, kind of weird in a way when you made me hold a press conference uh, to talk about anthrax and I thought, what if somebody actually uses this film? <laughs> it was just a drill. Um, but, but we, we went through those exercises so that when the, uh, when the um, um, storm that resulted in a number of fatalities came in 2011, uh, the response by all state agencies was, was quite positive. Um, there were, uh, I mentioned medicines, uh, pharmacies uh, delivered um, prescriptions on horseback and by snowmobile uh, to areas that were, uh, where the roads were, were taken out by the storm. And so everything really clicked well. And, and this may be a model um, uh, in terms of our public health infrastructure. I was concerned when I took office about our capacity to respond to any type of emergency. So I asked FEMA to come in and, uh, and look at our emergency operation uh, system. And uh, they have a bunch of criteria by which they mm. rate uh, state systems. And, and we didn't do very well uh, that first time. So we worked on it during the uh, time I was in office. I invited them back in my last year in office, and we aced it. Uh, so so it, it's not exciting stuff in many respects, but it's important uh, when an emergency occurs. And Martin, you mentioned a pandemic, so I, I guess you both did. Uh, it struck me that uh, when Mike Levitt was the Secretary of Human Services, Health and Human Services, he came to every state to talk about preparing for a pandemic. And he was thinking it was you know, within a decade of the centennial that you mentioned, Anand, of the uh, Spanish flu outbreak. And um, he certainly got everybody's stress level up, but also our, uh, our vigilance uh, to make sure that we took some of these preparatory steps. And I thought that was uh, very helpful in terms of the relationship between the federal and state governments. Got the Governor Douglas talked about the all hazards approach. And, and we certainly uh, use that uh, in the homeland security capacity, public health, uh, we we, we were of the belief that look, these are these are capacities that should be used every day, not something to be put on the shelf and then you take it down when the big pandemic hits or a bio attack. Uh, I remember uh, very distinctly how overwhelmed we all became by the anthrax scare. We we're you know sending out. Uh, public health people and uh, our labs became overwhelmed, our paramedics, uh, every time somebody spilled some coffee creamer, they were calling 911 and, and the ambos were going there. Boy, that seems like a long time ago. Not as long ago was the H1N1 uh, uh, epidemic and the way that we rallied around that and even were distributing Tamiflu and doing other things in the course of, of that. 
You know, George Washington once described public administration as a longitudinal experiment. You know, you try things, you see if they work. If you get a better result, you do more of it. And in a way, that really is what public health is as well. And there's a, you can advance greatly in the, in the midst of an emergency, that, that experiment. But you can also perfect it every day when it comes to reducing, uh, reducing uh, or, or rather improving outcomes for patients, uh, reducing avoidable hospital readmissions, the disparity that exists on, on so many indicators uh, uh, between poor people and wealthier people in our country in terms of their own health outcomes. Uh, but, uh, but Jim, uh, Governor Douglas also mentioned something else which is very, very important, and that is having, doing training exercises, the tabletop drills. I don't think we ever did enough. I mean, we did enough so I could sleep, but we didn't, I don't believe that we ever did enough. Uh, and, I, and I do believe it is, uh, there is a lot of room there for us to perhaps take advantage of the gaming technology. They come out with new games, real lifelike, mm -hmm. all these shoot 'em up games every Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't it be good if we, we figured out a way that we could uh, train and drill with that same sort of gaming capacity. We've never had better tools to model and to measure uh, our physical and our built environment and the human dynamic that unfolds over that dynamic in a time-space continuum. And um, I, I believe that the training and the drills and the exercises are really key. And maybe there's something we can learn from the way that, for a time anyway, I don't know if they still do it, uh, DHS used to rate all of the states in terms of their homeland security. They eventually arrived at core capacities. Uh, I know that the ports, I know the Coast Guard does evaluations of port security. And uh, you start where you start, but every state can get better every year. And it's the same sort of thing that I believe we need to lift up uh, in our public health infrastructure. <clears throat> Governors, I, I do need to ask you one question, a uh, federalism question, since both of you are, are, are here. We're uh, both in favor of it. <laughs> <laughs> so as you know, the recommendations do call for a public health infrastructure fund, mostly financed by the federal government, but there is a 10% state match, as you heard. Can you talk a little bit about the shared responsibility, shared fiscal responsibility between the federal government and, and the state government uh, to ensure that, that there's sufficient public health capabilities to protect uh, the American public? We always were receptive to public resources from Washington, weren't we, Martin? Yes. Uh, um, but to be honest, um, the federal government is uh, not flush uh, right now, uh, and we're coming uh, to the 10-year mark on this economic expansion so that it's very possible in the near term states are going to have more uh, constraints on their resources as well. So we can't just uh, assume that a new spending program is going to be created willy-nilly, even though, as Governor O'Malley said, it's in the scheme of things, there's not a whole lot of money. So it's got to be um, um, thoughtful. It's got to be targeted. It's got to um, be designed to uh, show a return on that investment. And uh, perhaps the DHS-FEMA uh, approach of uh, rating um, infrastructure uh, is is a model for that to uh, to uh, establish some standards, uh, test states against them, against them, and uh, and provide support accordingly, rather than just uh, a per capita amount that um, might be used uh, better or or not in uh, in one state or another. But um, we certainly look forward to exploring those possibilities. Um, uh, as Bill said at the uh, in, in the, his introduction. Um, the fact that both parties seem to be talking about infrastructure as a uh, shared goal during the next uh, Congress, uh, perhaps that uh, definition can be broadened and, and this can be part of that discussion. I know from our time together in the, in the National Governors Association and Governor Douglas was respected by Democrats and Republicans alike and he was the, the chair of the National Governors Association. I know among the, the Republican governors there was a tendency uh, to, to embrace the notion of block granting dollars to states. And, and that could well be, a, uh, that, that could be a, a, an avenue where uh, we can find a, a lot of support among Republican governors and Democratic governors, provided there are certain core capacities that we know these dollars are, are producing. I, I truly believe that th this is a small amount of money to spend. Uh, but I used to make that argument on Homeland Security dollars as well. And the more 9-11 faded into the rearview mirror of our public memory, uh, the more those dollars declined. Uh, 
the, uh, uh, there is a rising set of expectations that citizens have now in this age of, of, uh, of information, uh, uh, whether it's from Uber or these other personal apps that show you or the on-time delivery. Too many needs. You can't order a shirt online without it. You're getting 10 emails about telling you uh, your shirt left the warehouse. Your shirt's going down 95. Uh, so uh, we laugh, but all of that carries with it a big responsibility for those of you charged in public administration, which is, is your, your authority no longer derives from your title. We must be able to show one another and show citizens that we're getting a return on what we invest for our dollars. And especially when it comes to emergency preparedness, that show me has to also apply to what it does for us on a daily basis. When mom or dad falls and breaks their hip, uh, or when you know your child has some sort of strange malady that you that you just can't get to the bottom of, and you you need that result back from the lab quickly. So, uh, I think that I think the combination of the block grants, standards, and goals in, in terms of definition of these capacities, and the ability to use them day in and day out for reducing infant mortality or or improving outcomes for people that suffer from diabetes or congestive heart failure or asthma. Uh, these are the sort of common platforms, the, the tools of the information age, that people have a right to expect their, uh, their governments at all levels to be able to embrace and to use. Great. Well, uh, Governors, th thank you both for your leadership and, and, and your time. I think we're going to get you back in a few minutes for, 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 the, for the question and answer period, but, but uh, uh, I really want to thank you. Um, on behalf of the Bipartisan Policy Center for Thank you. Thank you. So, so at this time, I, I'd like to introduce uh, Rebecca Adams. Uh, Rebecca will be moderating our second panel. Uh, Rebecca is the, the health editor of CQ Roll Call. Uh, and, and Rebecca's covered uh, health policy issues for over two decades now. And so we're thankful Rebecca is here. And if I can invite our, our second panel to come up the stage, and Rebecca will be introducing them as well. All right. Well, thank you, Anand, and thank you to our audience for joining us today. Thank you to the Bipartisan Policy Center. Welcome back, Karen. Thank you. We have Dr. Judith Monroe. Dr. Monroe is the president and CEO of the CDC Foundation. She is a former deputy director of the CDC and director of the Office of State, Tribal, Local, and Territorial Support. She also previously served as Indiana's Health Commissioner. We have Dr. Josh Sharfstein. He is um, director of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative, and he previously served as the Secretary of Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Principal Deputy Commissioner of the FDA, the Commissioner of Health for Baltimore City, and as Health Policy Advisor for Henry Waxman. So he's been at all those levels. Welcome. We have um, Dr. Paul Jarris. He's the principal in the P.E. Jarris Health and Recreation Consulting Firm and an assistant professor of family medicine at the Georgetown University School of Medicine. He is also a previous Commissioner of Health for the state of Vermont, as we heard previously. So I will go straight to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, given your experience at the state level and as your work in leading those state officials, I wonder if you can talk just a little bit about this proposed fund and what the importance of that would be. Yeah, thank you. It's a good question. It's a very important fund, and I think we've heard people talk about it today in different ways. Most of public health is funded categorically by programs based on diseases, or, or occasionally um, we will come in and there'll be something like anthrax or preparedness or pandemic, and we'll have a bolus of money coming in there. And we've supported our infrastructure by piecemealing it out to these different categorical programs or loading it into one of these big funds of money that come along, and then they go away. And we're like, now what do we do other infrastructure? Um, so, for example, the, there was some funding for um, a couple of years for pandemic influenza. That <coughs> funding ended 10 months before H1N1. We had dismissed those people. And so there's a critical need here really to have this stable funding that's multi-year. It's very difficult to invest in long-term infrastructure when you have funding that comes and goes on an annual basis and you don't even know you're going to have it the next year. So can you actually contract for that IT, that laboratory, whatever it happens to be? So this really would be a game changer for us and ensure that we have that stable capability that we build upon for other programs. 
So Judy, let me ask you to draw upon your experience in Indiana and with the CDC. Mm -hmm. So where do you think the current challenges might be and what importance might this fund play in some of the things that we're facing yeah. now? So we have a lot of challenges, obviously, in public health. And every day there's an outbreak. You know, you can go to the news. I looked at the news this morning and there are outbreaks of hepatitis A in, in food, folks that handle food, right, or food outbreaks. And if you're living in that community, that has that outbreak, that's important to you. So if you don't have that capability, to me these these foundational capabilities are like the fundamentals of a sports team, right? They're gonna play better. So you're gonna raise all boats. And so we've got lots and lots of, of challenges, whether it's the opioid crisis or whether it's the next emerging outbreak. Uh, but I will say from my experience, I had the opportunity uh, at, at CDC to support all health departments. So I had an opportunity to have a very broad view uh, as well as a very up-close look at state, tribal, local, and territorial health departments. And it's very uneven. Uh, the capabilities of, of the strong health departments that have the resources, they make a big difference. They're, they're quicker on the draw. They're able to pick up those, uh, the new outbreaks and, and message more effectively and all the things that have been outlined. And those that don't have those capabilities, uh, those citizens in that community do, do suffer. Uh, and there, there are consequences. Mm -hmm. So Josh, you've seen that in action at the federal level, the state level, and the local level. So I wonder if you can talk about how this fund might play out and how it might affect value-based care and, and uh, address some of the issues that Judy raised. Well, I think it's good maybe to have a concrete example. I remember serving as Governor O'Malley's health secretary when there was a storm that people kind of predicted would be kind of like a minor storm and it turned into something called the derecho, which mm. I didn't even understand the concept <laughs> of derecho, but it knocked out power in Maryland, mm -hmm. large swaths of Maryland, for like a week plus. I remember And that. we yes. had to, um, I, I made the critical mistake of going on vacation within travel distance <laughs> from the emergency <laughs> operations center. And so I got, I got called and I remember there was a press conference, Governor O'Malley there, and I walked in and the only clothes I could buy at Walmart, which was like, it was over the July 4th weekend, like a big American flag shirt and all these things. <laughs> Everybody was in military fatigues or dressed up and the governor looked at me and said, you know, we have a patriotic health commissioner who just showed up here. For that. <laughs> so um, we we had to um, realize it, and you know, in, I think about this every time I read a story about a crisis where the temperature goes up, like you read about in Florida, people are dying in nursing homes, people are dying in different places. Well, we had immediately the the crisis of power being knocked out to dialysis centers, to assisted living, to nursing homes. And we had to rely on the whole public health infrastructure in Maryland. We had mm -hmm. previously given lists to each of our 24 health departments of the critical infrastructure in each county. And we um, had the local health departments figure responsible for figuring out the status of all of them, feeding the information to the state operations center so that either we could get power to them, we could get power to them through the correct, you know, the usual way, or like. I think the National Guard brought power to certain places and um, eventually we built the capacity where people could just update a Google Sheet and it would feed right up and the governor on his iPad would know where the power was out as would every one of the people in the emergency operations center who are working with the utilities. And you know, you do that and you say, well, I guess there wasn't a tragedy, so who knows how much what, what we did help, how do we know? But then you go back and you read the stories that it is not guaranteed to work out that way. There are mm -hmm. some serious tragedies that have happened since then. And if we didn't have all those people, that readiness, that practice to respond to that, you know, you get real tragedies. Everybody pointing the finger and all the horrible things that happen with the loss of life. Mm -hmm. Could I add oh, to that, yes. Josh? Because I think the examples are, are, are good to give. Um, were, were we not to have this continuous infrastructure and we had a power outage, how would we possibly at that time learn who might be home on a respirator or a dialysis machine? But with the consistent funding, we actually know who those people are ahead of time and can activate at a moment's notice. Again, no infrastructure, no activation like that. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can think about the country writ large and the patchwork of capacities out there. And um, Josh and Paul, you might be able to address this. So if we were to invest in this type of fund, what sort of can you talk about the accountability piece and, and what state and local jurisdictions might need to do to stay accountable and make sure they're doing their part? Sure, happy to. Um, well, there has been some work done uh, already on that, and I saw Kay is here from FAB, somewhere in the back. There you are, Kay. Um, and, and FAB did look at the um, foundational capabilities 
and the accreditation process. And of the 100 measures in the accreditation process, 76 of them uh, are closely aligned with the foundational capabilities. So they, they are well covered. Um, when they looked at the, about 270 health departments who had submitted their data so far, approximately 90% of them would be considered compliant with uh, or meeting the standards. So that's quite good. Now, however, 270 is less than 10% of the health departments. So there's a lot more out there. And you can imagine those who have applied for accreditation are the most capable health departments. Mm -hmm. So really, but it does show us that the accreditation process is well aligned. Um, in addition, two of the fundamental components of accreditation process, one is a community health needs assessment, which every jurisdiction should be doing. I, I would propose, and perhaps you'll tell me, Kay, it's already in there, that this infrastructure should be a component of the community health needs assessment and the community health improvement plan. Th those documents can then create a work plan that can be looked at by the funders to assure you have a plan, it's sound, you're making progress on it, and then you're moving toward accreditation. Maybe just to take a, a little bit of a step back, I remember my first day as health commissioner for Mayor O'Malley, and it was a day where I had to stand up in front of city stat and answer questions about what was going on in the city of Baltimore. And the first question was, I believe, something like there are 15 dead birds at 25th and Charles. Could that be bird flu? <laughs> and I said, you know, I sure hope not, you know, but, but suddenly it's like, well, what is going on with animal control? What, what is even animal control? What are my responsibilities? And I grew up under not only city stat, but state stat, where we had all kinds of metrics, you know, on our website, talking about publicly. The governor had certain metrics that he was, you know, totally focused on. And ultimately, we um, created essentially uh, a set of core health measures for the state of Maryland, and we gave each county uh, their measures, their racial and ethnic disparities in those measures, their trends in those measures, and ask each county to put together a plan against them. And, you know, it elevated what public health um, meant to people. It, it brought in not just the, you know, medical systems, but other systems in different counties to work on it. It was a little bit of, you know, precursor to what Karen has uh, really provided tremendous leadership on on Public Health 3.0. I think that if we're stuck just sort of waving our hands and telling people what public health is, it's going to be very hard to maintain momentum for investments. But if we're able to, you know, bring the philosophy of state staff, the philosophy of performance measurement, and show people that what we're doing is having an impact on their lives right now, that it is moving the needle on preventable disease, and we hope, you know, will meaningfully uh, uh, improve the quality and, and quantity of life that people have, that it will be reinforcing to the whole idea of bringing more resources to the problem. Thank so you. was Governor Go O'Malley reassured when you told her it wasn't bird flu, that it was West Nile that killed the birds? <laughs> <laughs> I think it, uh, I think it might have taken a, not, a Mayor O'Malley, I think, believe me, I'm not sure everyone on his team did immediately, but eventually we worked it out. <laughs> well, I, I was the health commissioner in New Orleans, and I started in 2011, and I stepped in, this is when I got to know Judy quite well, um, I stepped into um, a health department that was um, in terms of this uneven capacity, really struggling mm -hmm. to just keep up with the basics. Um, and I don't even mean the building blocks, the foundation, but just the sort of core work we had to do every day. We had infrastructure issues, lack of IT, workforce that hadn't been trained in a long time. And I think it was a, um, a real wake-up call for our new mayor and our community that we needed not, not only to sort of stand up the health department, but make it take the opportunity to be 21st century. And that's sort of how a lot of this public health 3.0 emerged and we were able to do a lot of you know fast forward things around uh, leveraging data to really be able to hotspot the highest need people in the event of disaster or every day but the the process of it i think that that this the i could tell a lot of stories about dead birds on corners or <laughs> white powder events events in your own dental clinic um uh, things that you know happen to a health commissioner every day and and i, I want to raise that for this group that hasn't sat in that chair anyone who has knows that it's not the disaster headlines that you want to necessarily, uh, that you struggle to always be prepared for. It's that every day, the small uh, crises that occur, lead in a playground, a boil water advisory, and then just the importance of staying ahead of what might be coming on the horizon, making sure that you're able to track the data to identify the most vulnerable populations, to have a team and a set of partners that are ready to surge in the, in the event of disaster. And, for us in New Orleans, people sometimes think of us as a big city, but we're actually pretty small. Our population, certainly then, 
was even smaller. It was post Katrina, but um, it was. Um, I, I think that the the for us it was two nickels and some friends of how we got to accreditation and friends included uh, Judy and the CDC helping us see the future and and others at the, at the accreditation board, but. So it's possible to do, even without a lot of resources, what's, right. but it's very difficult to do that uh, without additional resources, well, workforce, and financial, and to maintain. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's part of the impetus for, for us recognizing that uh, the will is a, is a big part of it, but there has to also be a way to create some evenness in public health infrastructure and to make sure that we can sustain it, again, not just for the, the big things that we read about, but for the stuff that's happening in your local community or at the corner uh, every day, really essential. Mm -hmm. Judy, did you want to jump in on that? Well, I, you know, one of the things that Karen raises is the, the role of federal government to give technical assistance. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we did. Uh, OSTILTS was the acronym for the office that I ran at CDC. And we looked uh, really hard at how we could provide public health law was one of the areas that we came in uh, to provide that technical assistance, how we could communicate out. We have to think as as a system, and we have to support one another. Um, and, and the other thing is, when we look at the public health system in the, the U.S. and look at the health departments, we have centralized states, so everybody, all the local health departments report up to the health commissioner or up to the state. You have decentralized, uh, Indiana's home rule, so I had no authority as the state health official. Uh, in many ways, you know, the health, the health officials at the local uh, health departments did not report to me directly. They reported to their county commissioners. Uh, and then you have hybrids of that. And so that gets, it's complicated, mm -hmm. uh, but it's really doable if we all come together and think in terms of a system and, again, mm -hmm. try, to, try to raise all those. And, and build that foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that, that does raise an important point here because what the foundational capabilities are not saying is that every health department needs to have all of this. It's basically saying the member of the public should expect this. And it's between the local, the state, and the federal health agency, somebody there, or perhaps even a private agency, will, should be providing it. So in other words, it's, it's an it's a pr important perspective, and it does account for the different structure uh, of all the different states. Because in Vermont, we were, a, again, a centralized state where local health departments reported up, even though every time I saw Governor Douglas, I tried to duck responsibility for that. <laughs> but, um, um, and, and other states, as Judy mentioned, are complete home rule. And in, in this case, it doesn't matter as long as the people receive the services they need. But it, it, it probably would be impossible to say that every health department is going to have these full capabilities. And, and it really should drive some rationalization of the system where we can say who is best able to provide, for example, public health laboratories. Mm -hmm. The challenges that states have are multifaceted um, with jurisdictions and all sorts of budget problems. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about implementing this on the local level and what some of the challenges might be for some of those local officials who might have to go forward with this if, if this ever were to be enacted. So Josh, would you like to talk? And, and Karen, you might want to jump in. Sure. I, I would just say, like as with every human endeavor, certain <laughs> things are easier in some places than they are in others. You know, we have 24 health departments, and some have you know new health officers who are just starting, don't know the ropes. Some are at their peak of their capability. Some are like looking forward to a very you know a retirement very soon and are not ready to implement something big. So you have to. Um, uh, you know, pace each system, you have to have a strategy. I think that one of the things I like about the proposal is that it really holds the states accountable for getting these things to happen and the states really need to step up into that role um, in order to do it. Um, the other thing is the varying um, health systems that exist. And, you know, we talked a little bit about health care, um, just comparing the $11,000 per person versus the 30-some that we're talking about here for public health, um, 32. But um, thank you, Karen. But the, the, the um, you know, uh, it also varies quite a lot, the ability of a health system and the public health uh, to work together. And if you're going to be able to accomplish a lot of these things in areas which are particularly rural areas which don't have um, maybe big health departments, you really have to think about the role of the health care system to partner with the public health system. Mm -hmm. And that varies a lot. So mm -hmm. I think um, an investment like this would have a you know, multiple positive benefits, but one of them would be to really force the conversation in different places of how healthcare and public health can work closely yeah. together. Mm -hmm. I, I want to I want to talk about accreditation for a minute. Um, Paul's raised it, but but I want to just keep underlining it. You know, when when I was a health commissioner, we we used that as our blueprint for modernization because there's so much inherent that makes sense about it, about 
structure and process, have, have a good strategic plan, have good business processes, do quality improvement, really work with community on, a, on how you improve their, their future health and have these sort of foundational capabilities in place. Uh, for, for, for me, it was a way that I actually uh, communicated with the city council and with the business community about how we were going to build not just a better health department because we said it was, mm -hmm. but because there was going to be an external entity that came in and looked over us and checked off things. And, and where we had shortfall, we would work with the state or <coughs> others to, to, to fill in those gaps so we could mm -hmm. protect the public's health in our, in our, in our area. And it, it resonated very well, frankly, um, with, mm. with the, the, the people who were funding us, basically, at the local level. And I felt a, a keen responsibility to be accountable. Mm -hmm. And so what I, I really um, want to, um, I, I know that that sounds challenging for a lot of small health departments. And so for people who are deep in this space, they worry, well, how can we possibly get accredited? It's going to be really difficult. But we know, for example, already that um, about 80% of the U.S. population is covered by an accredited health department, if you look at mm -hmm. states. It's a lot less on the, at the local level. But again, it's been done by small health departments like mine and by, by many others. So there is a some knowledge already in the community about how to get there, but I, I just, it's so essential mm -hmm. that we have a way to have some accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, I, I just know that it's a really good basic way to run the foundational capabilities is to have that kind of structure. Mm -hmm. Yes. There has been an effort, um, I'm going to guess five or six years now, perhaps even more, that Robert Wood Johnson has funded through the Kansas uh, Health Foundation, Pat Libby worked on it, to look at shared services mm -hmm. among health departments. Initially, they went in and talked about combining health departments, and the elected officials weren't that interested. Um, but mm -hmm. when they talk about shared service, there was much more interest in terms of, okay, you know, we'll buy this from you, we'll provide you that. But this can't happen without the elected officials actually being there and making the decision that across jurisdictions, things can be shared. But that kind of innovation is happening still across the country in states like Washington. Uh, Kay's over there shaking her head. And I think a lot of people in the community. And, and what, so what we're already learning in public health is that you don't have to be all things to all people. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is see that all people are protected, have their public mm -hmm. health protected. And that's, again, about how this funding is, is structured. Mm -hmm. And thinking about funding a little bit more, um, I wonder if we can also bring in the idea of private-public partnerships. Mm -hmm. And Judy, you might be able to address this a little bit. Absolutely. So talk a little bit about the future of that. Yeah, so I, I'm at the CDC Foundation now, uh, almost three years, and that's what I do now, are public-private partnerships and, and looking at uh, how, to, how to work together. Um, there's a lot of interest, actually. Um, and if we look at, uh, you know, so the 10% match that's mm -hmm. uh, been proposed, that's an area that uh, states uh, and locals might look to philanthropy. There are models that this has already happened, the California Endowment. Uh, has has uh, provided state match in the past and other private foundations. So I would certainly, at that local level, take a look. Um, and, and when you look at your businesses, too, I mean, when we talk about uh, even accreditation, rallying, I mean, that's, of course, one of the capabilities, foundational capabilities, right, is to get those resources rallied. But to get the, the business community at that local level uh, and, the, and the private, I, I'm amazed at how many private foundations there are at the local level, and they want to fund locally. Mm -hmm. they, they don't want to fund nationally or even at the state level. So there's some opportunity there, but public health needs to have the leadership capability to reach across and reach mm -hmm. out to, to engage those folks. Mm -hmm. Josh, did you have something to add? I was just going to say the healthcare system is the, uh, also an obvious mm -hmm. private sector partner here, and particularly where the healthcare systems are thinking about getting paid differently and not just doing fee for service. And if you take an example of like a flu season, a traditional fee for service hospital is going to make a fortune in Medicare payments for all kinds of people in a bad flu season. If they come in, they actually have a financial incentive for a bad flu season with a lot of sick people and even deaths. I mean, whether that's not to say they are hoping for that, but that is just a you know, cold economic ICU fact. Period prior to mortality. Yeah, right. Well, there you go. I mean, I, intensive care units are so much more lucrative than other beds. And so um, you flip that and you say, you know, a hospital that's committed to a value strategy, a state like mm -hmm. Maryland or Vermont that have now, mm -hmm. you know, made special arrangements with the federal government to, to basically um, control costs and reverse the incentives. Suddenly you have hospitals that say, you know, we're going to do better financially if we actually get the flu vaccine to the people who need them, mm -hmm. and we have fewer people who come in, that opens the door to so many different partnerships. When I was the health commissioner in Maryland, I used to have local uh, health uh, department leaders calling me and saying, um, do you have any idea why the hospital keeps calling? 
<laughs> you know, and the, well, the hospitals had a different in incentive, and they wanted to try something different, mm -hmm. you know, for a group of people that, for example, they finally figured out we're coming to the hospital. Uh, you know, we had a hospital took over the school health program because they were seeing so many kids come for asthma. And mm -hmm. like any other hospital in the country, they were making money off the kids who were having trouble breathing. Suddenly, when we changed their incentives, they were saying, how can we work with the health department to, um, to prevent asthma? and uh, actually make money under a different incentive. So I think that as those things happen, this really opens up, and then you have a situation with more funding coming in and the potential for a match, it really is you know, um, in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So we could have a very long conversation about those incentives and value-based care. I have a, a tough reality-based question. So if there is going to be a fund like this created in the federal budget, where could we perhaps find offsets or where could we, where, what could we live without in order to do this fund? She looks right at me. <laughs> this is, uh, so there are, um, clearly there would need to be some kind of an offset and I think that you could begin to think about kind of traditional places that we've looked for off offsets in, in funding for public health initiatives. Sometimes we call those sin taxes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, th there, there may be a pathway to thinking about raising revenue from, from a, a, you know, a sin, a sin tax of some sort. I think you could also think about um, basically this is an upfront investment. Mm -hmm. And the, the better we get as a country about thinking of funding and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, as, as Governor O'Malley said and, and, and Governor Douglas also, this isn't super exciting stuff, but it's real exciting when it doesn't work for you. And mm -hmm. suddenly there's an outbreak in your community, there's a challenge. And so let's avoid the excitement entirely and think about this as just a bridge that's never going to collapse or the highway that's always going to be available in there and there when you need it. And so, uh, you know, given, given the opportunity cost, I think that's really where I'll hope that the Hill We'll think about this as an investment uh, for, for our future generations and, and for today's world. Mm -hmm. Does anybody want to add on to that? I, I would just, uh, one of the things I learned uh, working for the governor was uh, we don't talk about taxes, we talk about raising the price of things like tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't use that T word. <laughs> but, but still, it's a similar concept and there is opportunity there. Um, but I, I agree. It, it is. It's a small amount of money, as Governor O'Malley said. I mean, thirty-two dollars opposed to eleven hundred. It's about one fourteenth, uh, eleven thousand. Uh, one fourteenth, the cost of what the increase in health care was last year. Small amount of money, which does provide dividends. And maybe the other way to do it is to say, how are we going to save here with this with this improved capacity and track that as a justification. So let me ask you something. How does an agency like, for example, the National Institutes of Health, whose appropriations is more than all of the appropriations for all the other public health agencies combined, how is it able to make the case successfully and get additional dollars and we don't see additional money coming to public health very quickly? Uh, the National Institutes of Health has been able to get bipartisan support because people relate to the diseases that um, it really is trying to cure. And public health, by the nature of prevention, oftentimes people don't realize, um, as some people have said, public health saved your life today, but you don't know, you it. Didn't know it. You didn't know it, right? So it, it doesn't get the credit. Now, um, I used to work at the Food and Drug Administration, and a piece of advice that I got before I started was every day you should take an hour and call members of Congress and tell them exactly what the FDA is doing in their district. And that will help them understand. You're inspecting the food, you're inspecting the drugs, you're protecting, you know, all, the FDA does a gazillion things in, uh, all over the country. It's a huge field force. People have no idea. And if you can make it a little bit more tangible, that may matter. Turns out there was a huge public-private coalition that came together called the Alliance for a Stronger FDA that really mm -hmm. did that. I didn't have time. But, you know, they have done a great job, and the FDA's budget has actually done quite well. I think that it's really important for people to understand at a you know, nuts and bolts level, the kinds of things that are happening across the country. And I think it's hard because, if, because public health is so stressed to tell those stories, mm -hmm. but it is yeah. meningitis outbreaks. It is just what Karen said, salmonella and, you know, the fountains. It's, you know, so many different things are happening. And when they go wrong, people think of them, unfortunately, as like personal failures and not system failures. We have to really try to use the, the, the actual natural interests that people have for them to really see that this is something that 
really matters. I mean, you don't want, uh, right now there's an adenovirus outbreak at the University of Maryland. There's a uh, student died. It is a horrible situation. The capacity to respond to things like that, how do we know that, you know, in your child's school, that this, if this would happen, that there would be an adequate response? People care about that. They need to, you know, that needs to bubble up first locally, ultimately for uh, leaders to uh, see that it matters to them. Yeah, I, I agree with all that, and, and some of what Josh is saying is that there's a constituency, and sometimes it's a disease constituency of, of, of groups where they're, they're really pressing for a cure. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, an innovation sense about the NIH, that mm -hmm. there's job creation, et cetera, all of which is, is true and good, and I, and I, I don't uh, at all want to detract from the importance of funding science mm -hmm. um, to help uh, advance the, the public's health. There, but there are other things that we must do as well. And, and so I, I'll just speak for myself. I think what's exciting about where we are with this report and all the work that so many people did to help us get here is that now we know what it takes. We know how we would hold um, the, the recipients accountable for the mm -hmm. funds. Uh, we, we have a sense about what that gap number would look like and how it might be applied, so we can work from there when, when the opportunity arises. But I, and I also, I'll say, am willing to methodically uh, make those uh, our morning phone calls like Josh is talking about to sort of build this consti constituency. Um, so I, I think it's going to be, a, it's a long game, though mm -hmm. I would love it if it happened now mm -hmm. um, and, and we didn't have to wait because, uh, as I said, and as you've heard over and over again, uh, we're in, the, we're in a, a really a difficult time with the public's health. I mean, uh, a decline in life expectancy from things that aren't about a particular disease like an influenza outbreak, but are these really broad, deep issues that, that speak to needing multi-sectoral partnerships mm -hmm. and really require mm -hmm. a convener like public health to be working with community and thinking ahead is going to take a, a strong foundation and a strong structure. So I hope mm -hmm. that the country is paying attention to the direction, the bad direction we're going, the fuzziness of the, of the reasons for that and, and really looks to public health and is willing to make that investment so mm -hmm. they can be there to protect them. Mm -hmm. Paul? You know, we've heard quite a bit about the declining life expectancy, which is incredibly important, but at the same time we're seeing increases in maternal mortality and we're seeing increased rates of preterm birth in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, both of those are far higher than any other developed nation. So we are seeing all, um, all our major health indicators. indicators declining right yeah. now. And <laughs> life expectancy is important, but babies and moms mm -hmm. Which, which I think this audience is probably savvy to, but I, I think that kind of the other point of this is that we spend $3.7 trillion on health care and it accounts for 10 to maybe 20 percent of our health outcomes, and, and this is an opportunity for us to be able to address uh, another big portion. Mm -hmm. and, and old diseases like syphilis uh, have been on the rise, um, mm -hmm. and these, these are diseases that we thought maybe we had eliminated uh, mm -hmm. or were close to elimination, and they're on the rise, so mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot to do. But we're full of a lot of doom and gloom, so. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a solution. Right. right. There we go. Well, I do want to remind the audience that you will have a moment in just a little bit to ask questions yourself and get in on the action. Um, I did want to ask, as we think about declining mortality, one factor involved in that is the opioid issue. So I wondered if the money that was provided through Congress last year for opioids, whether that might potentially have an impact on public health that you anybody wants to talk about? Josh? Go ahead. Uh, whether that would have an impact on the public health infrastructure or on the public health outcomes? Well, mm. outcomes generally. Yeah, well, the opioid epidemic is probably the single most prominent reason why life expectancy has been declining over the last three years. And um, the funding is, I would say, important um, to help states particularly organize their treatment systems, do some very basic um, filling in the gaps. Um, the states that have expanded Medicaid are doing much better in terms of expanding access to treatment. Um, but it's not enough, I think, to really turn the corner on the opioid epidemic. And I think this is an example right now. The way I would connect that issue to this discussion is that peop you know, um, the core foundational capacity of knowing what is going on with mortality in your your area is not well distributed across this country. There are places that are still using mortality data from a year or two ago. They missed um, many of those places. The fact that there was a huge spike in deaths from fentanyl until it was way too late. Um, the places like in Maryland where we had much more rapid 
responses, we could see what was happening much faster, and you get a constituency for action as a result of that. And I think the kind of core capacity we're talking about here is to really understand health in your area and to be able to marshal the response. And there are some great examples of where when the data came in, you had local elected leaders, local leaders really you know, make better use of the federal resources, put in their own resources, and you're starting to see in certain areas smart policies having an impact. But I think we're a ways off from really solving the problem. It actually could be a good example of where the infrastructure wasn't there. Uh, the opioid problem began a long time ago. In 2003, I got a report from the state coroner or the state medical examiner uh, about deaths. And even at that time, the death from prescription drugs was higher than all the illegal drugs. 2003. It wasn't until 2007, 8 this became a big national issue. So where were we for all those years? It, it was an issue in our state. We addressed it very aggressively, but as a national issue. So had we had better systems across the country, maybe we would have picked this up five years earlier. Yeah, and, and the... the a lot of what we're focused on right now, Rebecca, is treating our way out of the opioid epidemic and dealing with the supply side of the particularly legal but some illegal substances. Mm -hmm. I think what you see in, as a pattern in communities is that when you break off that supply of, say, prescription opioids, mm -hmm. there is a legal supply that comes in and or other drugs begin to be used, to, you know, resurgence of meth or, mm -hmm. or crack cocaine. It, and, and that is a symptom of an underlying a fundamental challenge is when you begin to look at the data, it's about things like lack of job opportunity, hopelessness, loneliness, particularly impacting rural America or people who feel like they're not going to get a, another chance in life, the people in, in middle age. So in, in the, that is, speaks to the fact that we can't just treat it. This is not going to be a medical solution. It's going to be a broader public health solution. People are going to need help with recovery, and that help with recovery is not just a treatment program, but a job and transportation and social support as examples. Mm -hmm. Did, did well, you have I, what I was going to say, too, I think a note about this is if we look back to the preparedness funding that came back in, you know, after 9-11 after and anthrax and so forth, that did help public health infrastructure to a degree. It helped build laboratories. I mean, there was, there was a lot of positive there, but then it goes away. So it's a real cautionary note. We can't, we've got to stop going after today's crisis and saying that funding is going to build what public health needs. We, we need the stability uh, of the, of the foundational capabilities. Well said. So Karen, how are we going to get there? What are your next steps for building momentum? Well, I do, I do want to take another minute to thank the people who have weighed in. And I don't mean just on this report, but um, as you saw in the, the top caption of the report, going back now to 2003, the, the, some folks at the Institute of Medicine have begun to build this idea that we need to modernize to a 21st century model. We have a way to measure and mark whether we're there around foundational capabilities. Now we've got our, an idea about what it costs uh, on a person level and then how that rolls up with the math to a national level, how we might come to a place of shared responsibility between the states and the feds. So, um, you know, really I think the next, uh, the, the beginning of this dialogue publicly is here today and I, what we hope is that this is not going to be a public health conversation. Uh, we, we keep saying it's about infrastructure because we genuinely believe that and we would like for this to be more of a public policy and a, and a civil, civil society conversation because this is really uh, to us essential for moving forward economically and with other, other vitality. It's not just about public health. So we do plan to continue these conversations outside of this room. I hope that people, if they have ideas and suggestions, will reach out uh, to us and, um, and, and weigh in on how we think we might be able to continue to make some progress. All right, well with that, let's turn to the audience. We'll invite the governors back up here, if you don't mind. We'd love to hear from you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. Caroline Pop, I don't, yes, I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin. I'm a primary care physician. I came in a little late, but I think what um, Dr. DeSalvo had to say is terribly important. Uh, I, I hear a lot about emergencies and the sort of traditional things that public health has done, emergencies, contagious diseases, water, stuff like that. Um, she said, and she's right, that medical care is ten, responsible for like 10 percent of uh, a person's health, and the social are 90 percent. And it's, I wonder if you're, that's new for public health, and I wonder if you're looking at how to do that. It seems to me, what I see now is 
Medicare Advantage plans are doing their own thing, hiring contractors who hire people who are very often not qualified. They work terribly hard. They get paid $10 an hour. Uh, the contractors charge patients $30 an hour. Uh, I think, I hope you're thinking about having public agencies like v or nonprofits like VNA uh, who can make a good living for these people and train them and have a ladder and have benefits. Um, and if there's a center, then the Medicare Advantage plans can pay for it. Uh, ordinary people, Medicare beneficiaries and others who need help from social work, who need Meals on Wheels, who need someone to monitor the medications, who need someone to uh, visit uh, a shut-in. Um, it would be wonderful if, they would, if there would be a public agency that did this that the private Medicare plans and health plans could, um, could work with and contribute money to, and you get your private, it doesn't have to be philanthropy. Thank yeah, so, so thank you so much for the question. Um, I'm a primary care doc too, so it's prob probably why we resonate. And in my professional journey uh, th that, that led me out of, out of the clinical world and into public health was to help address the broader determinants of health that my patients were facing. And um, I'll just share that this public health 3.0 model that we've talked about a few times, um, if you um, want to learn more about it, the, there, there is some old information on the Office Assistant Secretary for Health website, and then on the CDC, public, there's a CDC publication about it that's out in the peer-reviewed domain. And, and the reason I raised the Public Health 3.0 is that is really very largely the frame of what public health departments are doing on the front lines to, to move into the space of, of working to convene and address the social determinants, not alone, but with others, and, and, and many of the partners that, that you described. So there's good momentum from the public health world to, to do that work. Uh, I would just um, acknowledge also that there, I think there is some quite good dimension, a uh, good good activity happening in other arenas, not just to help the, uh, the the health of a person in the healthcare setting, but to your point, improve the context of their daily lives and really uh, see that that everyone has our, uh, an opportunity to be uh, economically viable and thrive and feel valued in society. So I'm actually encouraged. A couple places you can look for information, uh, but we can certainly talk afterwards, and I can send you to some more some more places. I think we're in a good we're moving in a good direction there. Do we have some other? Yes. Hi, Oscar Allen. Um, <laughs> so my question is as follows. Um, what inspirations or insight do you have as it pertains to the infrastructure development for attracting the next generation of uh, staff in the workforce to complement the needs at the local health, or I should say the public health level? That's for you, Josh. I'll caveat. There's obvious pathways to support or feed a health infrastructure workforce for state and federal, right? Whether it's EIS or state and federal agencies, but with respect to capturing the needed um, cell blocks at the local level, they seems to be less of an incentive for folks to be attracted to those positions. So within the infrastructure time umbrella, what elements do you find to be inspirational to help support that? Well, from a tra training, I think that's a terrific question. Um, if, you know, one of the things that's really made recruitment hard for local health departments is that their budgets have been decimated, you know, over the past decade. And um, they have been shedding staff and not in a position to hire. And um, if the ones that have been able to, you know, do great things, do interesting work, it's a fa fantastic place to work. And um, it's really important for the public health uh, educational field to be training people for those kinds of jobs, not just necessarily the narrow jobs that maybe were public health jobs 20 or 30 years ago, but for the kind of jobs that do work that Karen is talking about or we're talking about of really making a community healthier. The, I've got four students here from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, came down on the train with me. Um, there's a lot of interest in local public health work at the school. Uh, we have a new um, you know, scholarship program through the Bloomberg American Health Initiative that um, trains people in public health departments to try to be the 
kinds of leaders that we want to see to do work with different sectors and really addressing some of these underlying challenges in health. But um, it's, a, it's a major challenge. And it, I don't think it's a question of students not wanting to do this kind of work. I think it's the opportunities that exist at the local level and the need for health education to transform to, to, to really help them be, uh, do the work we want them to do and they want to do. Could I say something about it also, um, Mr. C. Oscar? Um, I think looking at the pipeline is going to be important. The context now is we have an aging workforce in place, many of whom will retire. Um, we also have laid off about 20% of the public health workers since 2008. So this, the, the roles are really down. The encouraging things are that public health is a, becoming a very popular undergraduate degree major. Um, Crazy popular. Yeah. And then, and I think, and, and for the governors who are participating in the education talk tonight and tomorrow, looking at the pathway from um, community college to, to bachelors to masters is probably where to look. I think we could bring a lot of people in through the community colleges. <laughs> Um, and this would be an attractive uh, profession for them with a career path and jobs available. So I'd ask you tomorrow to talk about that in your... Another BPC project. That's right. <laughs> We're on it. I saw a few other hands. Can we get a microphone? Hi, hi everyone. Um, George Benjamin, the American Public Health Association. You know, the... Obviously, you can you can always raise more revenue, uh, but I, as I've always noticed that the real issue here is how do you deal with the wrong pocket issue? Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact is, no matter how efficient you get, um, the money is always in someone else's pocket. And uh, as we do deal with social determinants, um, how do you grab those dollars, um, account for them, uh, even if you make an initial investment and you get improved efficiencies? How do you grab those dollars and then reinvest them? Um, into this broader aspect of, uh, of, of public health. You know, I think this is a place where states have a lot of opportunity for innovation, George, and, and um, it, relates, it relates to their public health budgets, their Medicaid budgets, their social services budgets. It's harder to do at the federal level for statutory and other reasons, uh, but, but I would say there's um, uh, interest at the state level and, and, and in the part of... of uh, actors in the community um, who, who are delivering services of different kinds to really think about how to solve the wrong pocket problem. But it's going to take some, um, some demonstration work that gets to kind of an actuarial basis so we can build a, a, really a business model around it to really understand that what the value add is of addressing the social determinants and who, who best delivers that, um, public health or, or other parts of human services. So it's, uh, I'm not trying to be overly optimistic, but I do think that given the interest and energy, that we'll probably be able to closer get to that um, through some kind of a per capita funding experiment at the state level. And, and I think there's some willingness to try it. What I, what I would particularly want to emphasize is that in those models, I, I want public health to be included, uh, not just because I care a lot about public health, but because I think that's the long vision and the collaborative opportunity that public health brings to that to that viewpoint. It's not just about the healthcare system and the social services providers. So I think we might be able to squeeze in one more quick question. We can get. That. Thank you. Hello, I'm Embry Howell from the Urban Institute. I'm wondering, I haven't read the report, so uh, it's probably in there, how you're envisioning the funding flowing uh, if it's a block grant, would that be administered by the CDC to state health departments? And there is this uh, structural issue. You have these huge uh, New York City, Los Angeles. H how is the money going to be administered? CDC's never had a block grant like SAMHSA. And, uh, the other agencies. So, yeah, there's, there, there's plenty of room to lose a lot of friends uh, in this approach. <laughs> and um, you know, the the way that we've conceived of it is that there would be it's a per person payment, so a population based payment, which already calls into question things like, I'm the state of North Dakota. Will I have enough money to run my health department? Uh, just with because of my low population. So there's going to have to be some thinking, assuming that we get 
to, to George says that we're going to get the funding, assuming, assuming we can get there. Um, so there's there's that component. There is a component of the let's let's say hypothetically the CDC is best suited to do that because that's where a lot of funding goes to states anyway, and the vehicles exist. Then at the state level, I think there's also this um, challenge not only for big cities but for little. I think the small jurisdictions, the small county health departments, um, are are going to be the most concerned about whether they're going to be able to adequately uh, do the services expected through accreditation and otherwise if they don't see see the full sum of funding. And and so Paul's point earlier about how should we be thinking about regionalization, shared services. I'm going to say all the words that local public health is worried about, but I think that's part of our responsibility and accountability in the public health sector to modernize and to be rational in the way that we're thinking about not protecting our own budget, but protecting the public's health. And just quickly, the CDC does have the prevention block grants, about $150 million, I believe, now that goes to the states, so they do have experience with that. And we have one question for the governor. Anybody have a question for the governors while we've got them? Yes, please. All right, this is my one question I had. Uh, you mentioned that you would like to get more handicapped people or more people with disabilities working and contributing, and most of them are. Um, the, the problem is they can't work because by law, if they earn over $1,000, $1 more, they're not considered not handicapped, and they would lose all benefits. So is there anything that you can do legislatively to allow those people with disabilities who want to work more hours, allow them to work those hours without the penalty of losing benefits, be it health care, housing? Um, I think you've identified a, a challenge in a lot of public um, uh, programs, uh, the cliff eligibility challenge, the benefits cliff that many states are, are wrestling with. And uh, we addressed it in a couple of our programs in Vermont uh, for emergency fuel and child care subsidies. But there are still a lot of those cliffs out there. Uh, some of them may be federal uh, requirements. Others, uh, the states have some discretion. But you're exactly right. We want to make sure that uh, if you earn another dollar, there's not a disincentive to, uh, uh, to prevent you from working. So um, good point. By the way, on the grant formula, we, we need the small state minimum. I assume that's a given. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Abby Dilling. She's the <coughs> Vice President of Programs for Resolve. So it's my uh, honor to, to do the wrap up. And um, I wanted to start where, where Bill started, actually, um, at the beginning of this event in terms of really the purpose of, of this uh, event being to expand the conversation and engage a lot more policymakers in the importance of and an approach for um, investing in uh, creating the conditions in which all people, all people um, can be as healthy as they can be. And um, where we go from here, I think Karen articulated it very well. It's going to take continued work that a lot of people, so many of whom are in this room right now, um, to continue that work and conversation and be prepared, hopefully, for um, the, the opportunity over the next uh, new Congress and, um, and general investment in infrastructure to have the opportunity to, to include public health in, in that investment. Um, I just want to thank uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that has provided the resources for the Public Health Leadership Forum um, effort in this particular initiative. I um, want to thank um, Governors Douglas and, and Governor Wilder. Er, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Douglas and um, O'Malley for being here, I apologize. Um, and uh, also our um, moderator, Rebecca Adams, and uh, Paul Jarris, Josh Sharfstein, Judy Monroe, and particularly uh, a thanks to Karen uh, DeSalvo and Jeff Levy, who took a lot of input by a lot of uh, people um, uh, participating in the Public Health Leadership Forum over time and making a cohesive uh, report that hopefully all of you have had a chance to pick up either outside or go to the website for the event. Um, and in particular, I wanted to thank the Bipartisan Policy Center for being such a great partner in this whole initiative. And um, in particular, uh, for Bill Hoagland and Anand Parikh, who have been participating uh, throughout this uh, effort, and um, Joanne Donlan, who's been fantastic in just making this all happen. So thank you very much. And I uh, uh, want to just thank everybody, and we're out of here at 4. <laughs> so thank you.